Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Shuchan Raghosh, Professor, Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture, University of Calcutta. The subject is Indian culture and the paper is Social and Cultural History of India. Today I will be discussing with you influence of foreigners in Indian culture. Now when we talk about foreigners, actually we are talking about three groups, for example, the Greeks, the Shakas, Pahlavas and the Kushanas. And it is important for us to study the impact and also the interactions that we had during uh, their rule in the Indian subcontinent. We have to remember that in early period there were no frontiers. So people from the north of the Hindu Kush were easily coming to the down to the meet the people of the south in of the Hindu Kush. So it is a region saw frontier but there were lots of passes and there was continuous movement and migration between people. So naturally when people were meeting each other so their culture and our culture met and there were a kind of a cultural acculturation or in some cases there were influences. The importance of studying this is that we are actually trying to understand what happened when the two groups or the we met the foreigners met the Indians and how each of us gained from this interaction. During the post Mauryan period that is from the period from 200 BCE to CE 300 as I mentioned earlier, groups comprising the Bactrian and the Indo-Greeks, the Shakas or the Indo-Scythians, the Indo-Parthians and the Kushanas were ruling in northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. The Kushanas however extended the rule to the mid-Ganga plains for a brief period and that we learn from the Rabatak inscription of Kanishka where it is said that he came actually he ruled regions till Champa. As all these ruling groups ethnically did not belong to the Indian subcontinent, they earned for themselves the appellation foreigners. The terms by which these foreigners were referred to in Indian literature were Yavana, Shaka, Pahlava and Kushana. So you can see that Shaka, Pahlava and Kushana are ethnic names but Yavana was a generic name and it signified initially the Greeks and later on at one point of time all the foreigners were known as Yavanas. Since they ruled in India for a pretty long time it is natural that their rule would have some kind of impact on the cultural life of early India. Now let us talk a little bit about how the texts from the, uh, particularly the Brahmanical texts, how did they look at these foreigners? What kind of information that we have regarding these foreigners in this text? The information is very little and we have that we find that the, the attitude was very ambivalent. First, these foreigners were socially excluded. But gradually when there was interaction and some of the ideas and knowledge were accepted, they were ultimately incorporated in the society. So we have reference for the Yavanas being in the beginning such sudras where which means that their utensils could be used. But they were not within the fourfold Varna system. But later on we find that they were elevated to the position of Bratya Kshatriyas. Perhaps the power that these groups wielded that led to the authors of the Brahmanas to change their uh, position and they became the son of Jajati. But the term Bratya shows that they were not incorporated in the fourfold Varna system. There was however a transition in their attitude when we perceived that there were that there was an attempt to, make, to bring these foreigners within the fold of Brahmanical society purely because of their powerful positions. 
the Manusmriti mentions them as Kshatriyas and gradually becomes Vrishala for not observing daily rites and for violating the injunctions in the Shastras. <coughs> now, these people, as I mentioned, through interactions, influenced some areas of our culture and those areas among those areas dressing cos that is costumes jewelry are very important so we find that foreign influence could be perceived in the dress and ornaments of the people of the subcontinent uh, there were references to chinapatta chinangshuka and china sambudham Kitaja stuff in the Acharanga Sutta, the Arthashastra and the epic also show that during the early centuries of common era, Chinese silk became quite well known in India. As we find that we have the change, the transition from the unstitched cloth to the stitched cloth. Cotton seen costumes like cloaks, chitons and trousers were adapted from the Greeks and the Kushanas as the utility of these clothes were realized. We see that the Greeks introduced a kind of a cloak which was known as Himaten and we see that also in the coins and also in the terracottas from Taxila. Even the reliefs from Bharut show the sun god in a northwestern short sleeved coat, dhoti, a ribbon around his head and with the typical Greek leggings. Several types of caps were introduced by these foreigners. Indians used generally uh, ushnisha or turbans. The kilt and the tightly worn dhoti that we normally see that was described in the text soon gave place to the skito trou kushana trouser. Central Asian long coat and high boots became very popular in North India and in the Puranas we have reference uh, to know uh, where we it is talked about these were Uditya Vesha. The tunic and trouser were adopted by the Indian rulers also. So we have coins where we find that Chandragupta I and his son Samudragupta is seen in their coins in tight breeches and bead decorated coats. Long coat called Kanchuka was in fashion. Even when we, much later when we read Bana's Harsha Charita, we find that he writes that Harsha was wearing a Kanchuka. So, these coats, jackets, use of stitched clothes became very functional and so were used by the people in the Indian subcontinent. Among the caps, this, there were several types and if we look at the coins, we find the different kinds of helmets were also been there, headgears. The high conical headgear worn by Vasudeva in many of his coins, Vasudeva is a later Kushana coin, uh, Kushana ruler, appears with his variant on several heads found in the Mathura region. The caps generally seen to be wearing by Persians became very popular and I will show you some uh, pictures where you can see the, this. So look at this, this is the headgear of Vasudeva and this has been found in some sculptures. Then if you look up this painting from Ajanta, then you can see that the type of cap that is being painted, it is not a cap which was owned by the Indians. So it was a cap which was used by the foreigners and this type of cap became common in the Indian subcontinent, the Western Deccan. So after cap or dresses, another area where the foreigners or the Greeks, the Shakas or the Kushanas had some kind of their uh, kind of uh, control or influence was the art of coiffure that how do you dress your hair. Foreign hairstyles were adopted by fashionable ladies of the court and even by the nobilities. The female figures from Mathura and Sanghol show rich and diverse hairstyles which had influence from the West. There are two distinct foreign type of coiffure that came to India. One is the alaka in which masses of curled hair are arranged in wig like fashion which are specially in vogue among the men folk. The other was the kumbha bandhana which was derived from the aristocratic ladies of Roman East 
chiefly from Palmyra. We know that Palmyra was a very important center in Rome, uh, in the Roman Empire. In this particular style, the hair arranged in a flat knot over the head like a cushion cap that was held in position with a fillet or a diadem. This style was very popular in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. You can see here two examples where you find the ladies wearing a kind of a headgear which was perhaps ha had some impact from the west. This is from Sanghol. Now I will come to a particular site which is very famous called Taksila or Takshashila. Now this is one of the archaeological sites which has been excavated long time back by Sir John Marshall and we have wonderful rep uh, reports of this site. Now the Greek cultural stratum, Greek or Skytopartian or Indoparthian cultural stratum was Sirka and the cultural influence of Greek is revealed in the excavated materials from this site of Sirkap and that is very significant. The greatest influence of the Greeks is seen in the technology of crafts and domestic utensils. In the opinion of Marshall, the Greeks gave a noticeable impetus to the use of stone for the manufacture of domestic articles such as dishes, trays and other things. From Sirkap, we find lamps made of stone copied from Hellenic prototypes. We have to remember that Sirkap was not a proper Greek town. We had the layout in the Greek fashion, but there were many things that were not in Sirkap. For example, there was no Greek inscription, there was no um, theater, there was no gymnasium. But even then, people were moving and with the movement of the people, like Hellenic people were also coming. So if here in the kind of the material culture, we have lot of evidence which had Hellenic prototypes. Among the other household objects, those having Greek influence were Candlebra, a three-legged incense burner whose handle takes the form of rampant or winged lions as an obviously West Asiatic or Hellenistic character, jugs with conventional dolphin handles, a common trait on late Hellenistic vessels, the tall offering bowl supported at the three corners of the base by birds and heads of uh, the spread wings. And this reveals clearly that Western classical uh, taste, which was very much evident in the material from Sirka. Another area where we have a very strong Greek influence in Sirkap was in the art of making jewellery. Jewellery was integral to Indian style of dressing and we know that in early India there were many beautiful jewelries that the ladies and even the men folk wore and that is evident from the sculptures. But the greek scythian influence added some novelty in the motif and technology. For example, if we take the technique of granulation and filigree, which are seen in the ornaments discovered from Sirka, we now know that the filigree from Orissa is very famous, but its origin goes to the Hellenistic period. The technique of granulation, that is the decoration of a gold surface with fine granules, was known in Greece and the Near East from a long time. And this technique was brought in Sirka through the agency of artisans who were always moving from one place to another. So when we look at influences, we also have to look at the agency, who were bringing this. The perfect examples of pattern granulation at Taxila are to be seen on the amulet containing a tooth relic and an amulet case, both dated around the early 2nd century BCE. The art of filigree uh, how it is done? It is affected by a soldering fine wire to the surface of the metal, the wire being either plain, twisted, plated into a chain or beaded. Examples of filigree work can be seen in the pendants 
and this method of decorating gold and silver ornaments surely came as I mentioned earlier from the Greco-Roman world. There is another kind of art which is also very extremely prevalent in India now particularly in the Rajasthan and other areas. This is the art of Meenakari that is enam enameling on gold and here too we can say that it perhaps goes back to the Greco-Scythian period. Sirkap has yielded all the specimens of enameling art found on necklaces and bracelets. The setting of stones also owes its origin to the Scythians who were masters of encrusting gold with variegated stones. We also find from Sirkap embossed wares of Hellenistic origin. This had the decoration confined to the central part of the inner bottom of bowls and dishes. The pattern of vine scroll was used either as an isolated motif or as a border of a central emblem. But this motif of vine was very common in this part of the world which was brought from the west, from the Greeks. In the field of jewellery again, we find that semi-precious stones were used in taxila and they were carnelian, chalcedony, agate, onyx, garnet, jasper, lapis lazuli, rock crystal and so on. Here again comes the availability of these stones. When we see some kind of jewellery, some objects with encrusted stone, we have to, if it is in a large scale, then we have to remember that these stones should have been available nearby. For lapis lazuli, we know that the source was the Badakshan mountains. Carnelians were also found in western India. It is understandable that the inlaying of gems were also very much involved, uh, important in the Greco-Roman world. Here you have some pieces of Sirkap jewellery. You can see the elaborate necklaces or the fine kind of granulation that was being done at that point of time. This particular earring from Sirkap is beautiful. It is in gold with encrusted stone. So as I mentioned and you here you have this encrusted stone with a fine kind of work that is very famous for the Hellenistic world. Jewelleries in the terracotta uh, or the stone objects also suggest that there was a kind of a movement of artisans. And in this particular sculpture from Gandhara, we can see a necklace and a long kind of a hara. Here we have reference to Greek jewellery represented in Gandhara. Then there are other avenues where we can see the representation of or the influence of the Greeks and here it is an example of a banquet scene. This is a toilet tray. When we studied the module of dress and ornaments, we know that there are cosmetics were used and there are toilet trays. So this is a particular toilet tray from Sirkap where you have the theme of the earliest tray depicting Apollo disrobing Daphne. The theme is extremely western and so is the costume and the style. In this tray, the finer inner portion is not compartmentalized. Another tray depicts a funeral banquet scene. It is divided into two registers. The figures have floral wreaths on their heads and are clad in Greek chiton and himarton. None of these trays are imports, they are locally made, which shows that this, the artisan had actually come here or it is the indigenous artisan who had learnt the art of making these toilet trays. Now when we talk of influence, we also know that we can, we have to, this influence can come from interactions. And now I shall discuss some evidences where interactions between Greece and India showed that there were areas of commonality. We have striking similarity between the appearance of Heracles fighting with the horse of Diomedes and the representation of the Puranic legend of Krishna 
killing the demon Keshin in the form of a horse. Along with Krishna Heracles, we also have myths which bear similarity between Dionysius and Shiva. That Hellenistic elements also percolated in the art of Bengal can be seen from a motif depicted in the terracotta seal found from Chandraketugar. Uh, now, the fact is that Heracles and Krishna, they, these are the two gods. Originally, they were heroes turned into deities. And these two gods had some labors to function. And among these labors, for Heracles, we have Heracles killing the horses of Diomedes. And for uh, Krishna, we have the representation of the Puranic legend of Krishna killing the demon horse Keshin. Commonality between the Greek hero, hero Heracles and the Indian hero Krishna has been traced in many spheres. It began with Megasthenes when he wrote as early as the 4th century BC that the Saurasenoi, that is the people of the Mathura region, held Heracles in special honor for there is no doubt that Heracles was the Greek analog of Vasudeva Krishna. The dress which Heracles wore, Megasthenes tells us, resembled that of the Theban Heracles. It is interesting that there is a striking similarity between Heracles's eighth labor, that is combating with the mares of Diomedes, and the Puranic legend of Krishna killing the demon Keshin in the form of a horse. It is one of the numerous legends about Krishna's childhood exploits. Heraclean themes have been used in the Mahabharata also in a systematic and a very creative manner. You can see here, this is a stone, weight stone from Gandhara, where we have the famous Krishna Keshi legend represented. And here the Krishna is represented in a boy form, because in the legend it is said that it was a boy Krishna who actually defeated and killed the Keshin, uh, the demon Keshin in the guise of a horse. This, the earlier one was from an early period from Gandhara as I mentioned and this one is from the 9th century, it is from Paharpur in Bengal. But here also the same legend is being represented and you have the boy Krishna here too. The other area where we have a kind of an interaction sphere is between Dionysus and Shiva. When the Macedonians arrived in India, they were led in the true Greek fashion to identify Shiva with their own Dionysus. This tradition got a new lease of life with Alexander's invasion. It is said that when Alexander came into the Indian subcontinent, there was this group in Nisa who went and told Alexander that Alexander should not kill them because they were the successors of Dionysus. The task was further made easier because like the task of identifying Dionysus or Dionysus's presence in the Northwest, it was stated in the Euripides that Bacchus, the other name of Dionysus, had made extensive travels in the East. The followers of Shiva, like those of Dionysus, indulged in wild revelry with music, dance and loud noise. Shiva's followers are also said to have be behaved in a very wild and weird fashion and uproarious manner. Another area of commonality is both Shiva's and Dionysus's association with snakes. The Mahabharata and the Harivangsha describe his figure as entwined with snakes and in iconographic representations, snakes are always seen coiling around his body. According to Art Apollodorus, Dionysius turned the Tyrrhenian ship's masts, sails and oars into snakes. An important connection of the cult of Dionysius with that of Shiva was also the worship of the phallus as the god's emblem, which was carried on in all Dionysiac procession. From this is a very interesting uh, picture where you can see that Pyxis with the triumph of Dionysius in India. And this shows the march of Dionysius who came from Thrace 
to India and settle there. So Dionysius and Shiva could easily be actually in understood from this point of view. Again when we move into Shiva, we find that his habitat is in Mount Mujavat where we have an abundance of the Shoma plant from which an intoxicating drink could be prepared. Shiva is also represented with the moon that is Shoma on his head and his followers are said to be indulging in intoxicants and finally in the post Puranic literature he is shown as addicted to drug and his cultic worship was cannabis indica as a ritual ingredient to be offered and partaken. So there is commonality between these two. Like Shiva, Dionysus too was associated with drinking wine. It was in Phrygia that Dionysus discovered the wine and taught men to make wine from it. Such goes the story. Orion quotes Megasthenes while, it says, while saying that Dionysus introduced the use of wine among the Indians as he had done among the Greeks. So this is a banquet scene which again shows Dionysus and Ariadne so, and he is actually enjoying his wine. Now this development of the, in the development of the mythology of Dionysus myths around Shiva played a great role. In the case of Shiva and Dionysius, we have seen that their earlier prototypes belong to the Indo-European group, while the later syncretist Hieropani belonged to the autochthonic category. Shiva had developed new traits earlier than Dionysius, who seems to have imbibed them during his eastern sojourn. So Shiva was already there in East, Dionysius came and so there were interaction and some of the traits of Shiva was perhaps imbibed by Dionysus. What is interesting is that the Dionysus, the god of wine, inspired many Buddhist artists of Central Asia and Gandhara. This god of ecstasy and intoxication perfectly exemplifies the composite iconographies that resulted from cultural interactions with the Hellenistic world. Judging from the archaeological findings also, this god was particularly popular among the Greeks and Scythians. Now we are moving to another motif which shows a Greek influence and this motif is from Bengal. We know that Hellenistic elements percolated in the art of Bengal and this particular motif is found in a seal of which is made of terracotta from Chandra Ketugar. The motif under discussion is that of a nude bearded male figure seated on a rock in a reclining posture. His left hand rests on the rock while his right hand is seen holding some object in Akimbo and you will see the picture now. A close look at this male figure instantly reminds us of a very popular representation on the coins of the Bactrian Greek and Indo-Greek rulers like Euthydemus, Agathocles, Antimachus, etc. Thus a well-known Greek motif, of course with modifications, was found represented on the object from Chandra Ketugar. Now this is the terracotta seal and if you look at this seal, you will find that a person like Heracles is sitting. It is a very crudely done, but the, there are some semblance with the next coin that will be shown to you. So here you can see that when you look at the motifs together, you can see that in the Greek coin you had, this is a coin of Euthydemus and you have representation of Heracles seated on a rock with the skin, lion skin being there and the club on the thigh. So this motif actually gives us an idea that how from far away northwest India the motif travelled as far as Chandra Ketugar. The question is how did the motif travel? Obviously it travelled with the merchants, we travelled with the people. So there were some ideas, coins are peripatetic by nature, maybe the coins had also travelled and we know from the Karoshti inscriptions that has been found from Bengal in the Chandra area that people using Karoshti uh, that 
treatments which who are in the northwestern part of the subcontinent were using karoshti and so these people had come to uh, west bengal this chandraketu region and so therefore this motive traveled from the northwest to eastern india so what you have seen and learned right away shows that that interactions between the greek and the spartians and the kushana world had some kind of influence over the different elements in the indian subcontinent we have also an important element in the art of music and in dramas we all are aware of the term yavanika but this term yavanika which means curtain probably comes from the term yavana who were using perhaps this sort of curtains in theaters because theaters were very important for the yavanas we have seen that the influence of the greeks percolated in different areas and there are sites particularly the site of sirkap has been studied thoroughly where we now see that hellenistic influence had a large and greater number of effect so the scythians and the parthians who actually followed the greeks were philhellenics and they continued the hellenistic tradition the kushanas were of course different they had in their mind the iranian tradition but even in their coins they represented some of the hellenistic gods and goddesses so this process of interaction actually brought in significant changes in the cultural life of early india thank you very much and please visit e patshala for further details